I will introduce uh, Scott McGinnis, who is here to talk to us about the early history of Excelsior and the South Shore. Thank you, Lisa. Well, I'm going to talk about the pioneering history of Excelsior. This is a map of Lake Minnetonka. It uh, is from about 1856. I found it on some letterhead uh, that uh, Bishop Kemper of the Episcopal Diocese of the Northwest uh, used. Uh, I colored the blue in there that you can see it, but this is the very first known map showing the entire lake area. Uh, but uh, so this was the environs as European settlement came to Lake Minnetonka. But there were people here before the European settlers. And here you can see this map uh, showing the lake. And each one of these red dots uh, shows the location of known groupings of burial mounds around the Lake Minnetonka area. Uh, it is estimated that there were uh, over 2,500 burial mounds around the lake. My feeling is it was much more than that. They say now that it's down to 50. Uh, I also believe that there's still several hundred uh, burial mounds still around Lake Minnetonka. So we had people here before the European settlement. This is what was inside of those burial mounds uh, from 1867 taken from uh, mounds on Starvation Point, which is uh, Orono Point, Brackets Point. Uh, and the mortal remains of the indigenous people here, but it was still a really relatively sophisticated uh, society. There were stone implements, but there was also pottery that was along with it as well. This little is a snippet from uh, something that Robert B. McGrath wrote. Uh, he said, there was a band of Sioux Indians and old, with Old Shakopee as chief, who used to come with his whole band, about 30 teepees, and pester the settlers to distraction. Shakopee, Little Six, was an awful talker and would come into the cabins and harangue you hour after hour. We were not afraid of them, yet they were lying, thieving set, and we never knew what treachery they might be up to. On Sunday morning, everybody had gone to church, but Mrs. Bertram and myself, when five gaudily war-painted red men stalked into the cabin and ranged themselves in a row. They could not speak a word of English, and their object could not be determined for some time. I, convinced, I confess that I was scared, but we put on a bold front on the matter, and they proceeded to make known by signs and a few Sioux words known to us that a Chippewa brave had taken one of the women prisoner and had scalped and burned her and they wanted to borrow our canoes to go in pursuit of them. I can tell you we were very anxious that they should take our canoes and considered the canoes cheap at twice the price. <laughs> Strange to say they did bring them back and gave in pantomime the capture of some of the Chippewas and their method of revenge which needed to be related. This is how the, the settlers in 1853 found the indigenous uh, Chip, uh, Dakota Indians at Lake Minnetonka. And it should be noticed, noticed at this time, uh, and this has been confirmed with the Shakopee Midwakanton, uh, Dakota, that there were no uh, encampments or settlements of Native Americans at Lake Minnetonka at the time of European settlement in 1852-1853. This was a no man's land. Uh, it was the battleground between the Ojibwe and the Dakota. So there were no settlements. There were no people being displaced. Uh, the Dakota, chiefly Shakopee and his Dakota uh, tribe would come to Lake Minnetonka. They'd rice, they'd get maple syrup. Uh, uh, hunt, fish, things like that, but they did not have any kind of villages at Lake Minnetonka. But this was Rob, uh, Robert McGrath's description of 1853. Uh, Hezekiah Brake, another 1853 settler, uh, expounded on this little disturbance. Uh, our small 
clearing plant and Farnham and I built us a boat and explored the lake shores Meeker's Island, afterward brought by Farnham, was also visited. We were horrified to witness during one of these excursions a brutal murder. A party of Sioux Indians then on the warpath against the Chippewas had captured one of the latter tribe and fastened to a tree on the island. Around them they piled brush and other dry materials which they had ignited and the flames were leaping up around the doomed Indian. Powerless to avert the Holocaust, we watched the terrible scene with a fascination impossible to describe. The leaping, shouting savages in their hideous war paint and feathers, the stolidity, stolidity of the victim thrown into relief against the gloomy background of sky and forest by the flames of the funeral pyre held our attention until it was almost too late to push away unseen in our canoes. In the morning, we visited the spot where the crime occurred removed the still smoking faggots and found bits of human bones, a finger joint and part of a skull. But for this, we might have believed the scene of the previous night, but a dream. Sick with horror, we were glad to leave the place and go to the Minnetonka Mill House. So this was the, the scene that Robert McGrath refused to identify in his previous article. Uh, this was also 1853. This was the result of those Indians going after the Ojibwe Indians uh, in retribution. Now this is a uh, spirit knob. Uh, you can see it off in the, the distance right there. Uh, so this is woodland, maple wood, and across here, this is Ferndale and Wazetta would be over here. Spirit Knob was one of the religious sites of the Dakota Indians. Uh, they ceded this whole area by, through the De Treaty of Mendota in 1851, and uh, they were removed from the Lake Minnetonka area uh, to the Lower Sioux uh, Reservation on the upper Minnesota River. They didn't all go at that time, but uh, uh, most of them were displaced at that time. And so that was the end of the, the Indians re relatively early. Uh, 1850, the winter of 1859 uh, and 60, uh, Cutnose from the Midwakanton, Dakota, the Shakopee tribe, uh, they camped west of Excelsior during that winter, and there were about 200 of them in 20-some uh, teepees that camped there. The natives here were kind of frightened uh, because the Indians hadn't been treated well. And in fact, in 1862 was the Sioux uprising, the U.S.-Dakota War. Uh, but this uh, little, uh, uh, it was a letter written by Charles Sheldon uh, to the American Home Missionary Society. Uh, and it says, on the 4th of July, at the invitation of the people of Wyzetta on the opposite side of the lake, a Sabbath school celebration was held at a point called Spirit Knob. The people around and in the vicinity of our beautiful Lake Minnetonka very generally assembled to the number of four or five hundred. The day was pleasant, the place was assembling, was romantic both in the, its nature, features, and in its association with the former race, meaning the Dakota. It was in a spacious grove on a long and narrow strip of land running out into the lake. The extreme point was a cliff 60 feet high on the top of which it was reasonably supposed sacrifices were offered at no recent day by the Dakota Indians. The cliff is connected with a grove in the rear by a well-known Indian trail. Here that tribe were accustomed to assemble for the celebration of their religious rites and from them the place receiving its designation Spirit Knob. The pleasure boats which brought the assembly together lining the shore on either side of the grove. The sacred instruments and vocal music which announced the approach of a new party, the friendly welcome and greetings of, on their arrival, the Sabbath school children with their various badges, the happy, intelligent countenances of old and young as they assembled in groups, the long rural tables loaded bountifully with refreshments, all formed a pleasing contrast with the wilderness 
of the natural scenery and gave evidence that a new era had dawned upon this wilderness. So even at this date in 1856, Reverend Sheldon is recognizing the, the change that's uh, come, that the Indians' time is over and the white man has taken over. And that leads us to George Bertram and the Excelsior Pioneer Association. Uh, and Bertram was a tailor. He lived in Brooklyn, uh, New York. He had a tailor shop at 268 Grand Street, which is just six blocks off the East River. And he was here in Minnesota in 1852. And uh, it's unclear exactly why some people are, some sources are saying it was for health reasons. He was fatigued by his demanding business life. Uh, and, but there's some evidence that it might have been for health reasons, but he was here and he was in St. Anthony. Uh, Robert McGrath, who was uh, just 21 years old at that time, had been in Chicago and then into Galena and he found out that well, passage to St. Paul was only 50 cents, uh, and it included five meals. So he said it was cheaper to go to St. Paul than to say in Galena. And he eventually got over to, to St. Anthony and met up with George Bertram. It was only in April of 52 that Lake Minnetonka was rediscovered, and they heard about it, and they had this plan of forming an association to bring uh, pioneers out to Lake Minnetonka. And in May of 1852, they came out to the lake and found this site right here that we're on right now and said, this is it. This is where we're going to bring these people. So they went back to New York uh, in Brooklyn and formed this association. People had to buy into it. There was a membership fee of 50 cents and 25 cents a week uh, after that uh, to run through July. They enlisted 62 families to come out to uh, form the new village of Excelsior. Uh, here you can see one of the articles, the tide of immigration is stronger this season than ever before. Since the opening of navigation, we have had an average a boat a day and all have been crowded with farmers who have come among us to till the soil. The nominee brought 50 members of the colony for which Messrs. Nutting and Nichols are the agents and the clearing brought upwards of 150 members of the Lake Minnetonka settlement, and still there's room, April 21, 1853. Uh, another, uh, just a month later, Excelsior Pioneer Association. This is the very first uh, official notice I can find of the Excelsior Pioneer Association arriving in Minnesota. Uh, a letter of recent date advises that this association are already on the way for their new home in Minnesota, or at least a part of them, and that the whole body will be on hand at an early day. The colony has selected a location on Lake Minnetonka near the Northampton colony, and we hear it spoken of as a fine selection. The association is composed of farmers and mechanics of almost every kind. The professions are well represented as there is one minister, one doctor, one lawyer, three schoolmasters, and et cetera, and et cetera. We are satisfied with the association will prove a valuable acquisition to Hennepin County, and we believe they will be well pleased with the location. Every member we understand will have some means at his disposal, and several of them possess a considerable amount. It is no small compliment to Hennepin County that out of the whole territory, these two colonies should have both selected their homes on Lake Minnetonka. We trust that the most, we trust the most abundant success will attend them. Uh, one week later, uh, May 27, 1853, George Galpin, the vice president of the New York Association, which was the Excelsior Pioneer Association, and several members arrived this week. He informs us that the balance of the colony will soon be on and has gone to Minnetonka to make preparation for the reception. 
From all that we can learn, this colony is composed of intelligent, enterprising, go-ahead men, just the class for Minnesota. Doesn't say anything about the women. So what did they live in when they got here? Well, this is one of the houses. This is Robert McGrath's house built in the fall of 1853. Uh, and up in the corner over here is the Excelsior House, which uh, stood where the back of the Dock Theater is today. But you can see this is all, it's all built out of logs. Even the gable end is all logs. The doorway doesn't look like it's more than five feet tall, and maybe the peak is nine feet. Uh, so not really much to look at. Uh, but this was uh, the third house to be built in Excelsior. And this is where it was located. It was right on this corner right here. Here's Cortland and 2nd Street right here. And that's how it looks today. This is a letter and it's uh, to my great, great, great grandfather's brother, Marvin Bennett. And uh, it's uh, a letter enticing him to come out to Lake Minnetonka. Uh, it, it basically describes the conditions here, the soil, the price of goods uh, and everything, and telling him that in this letter dated February 1854, that you better hightail it out here quick. Uh, you said you were gonna come out here in the fall of 1854, but you better come now because all the good selections of land are quickly being taken up. And <laughs> uh, and this is, you know, how a lot of people came to hear about Excelsior and Lake Minnetonka and Minnesota in general was word of mouth uh, letters being sent back east. Uh, at this time, he, Marvin uh, and the whole Bennett family were living in Little Valley, New York. So Marvin, his parents were Nathan and Betsy Bennett. Uh, Nathan was born in 1785. Uh, Nathan and Betsy, they brought five of their children and all their grandchildren out. Uh, they brought Eden Bennett, Isaac Bennett, Marvin, uh, Sally Bennett Booth, and uh, uh, Myla uh, Eldridge. They all came out in one company out to Lake Minnetonka, so there was just an absolute flood of Bennetts. Uh, and this is where my great-great-great-grandfather settled, right here, just south of Excelsior, uh, just off of Galpin Road. And you can see his uh, sister, Myla, who was the wife of Hiram Eldridge, was right next door. Uh, and uh, most of the, the housing of the pioneers was not like what you saw with Robert McGrath. This is what was very typical of uh, pioneer uh, preemption lands. Uh, this is the Isaac Bennett homestead. Uh, the top three pic two pictures and the one on the left are 1906. And it shows the typ very typical farmstead. But the bottom two on the right are uh, the original homestead from 1855. And you can see it's all log, except for the upper story, which is frame. This is very typical of any uh, preemption land. Uh, you can see the dimensions approximately 20 by 16. These were the minimum dimensions for a preemption of land uh, under the Preemption Homestead Act. Uh, it had to be six, at least 16 by 20, have one door, and at least one window. So uh, when, in 1941, they were tearing this down uh, to replace it. Uh, and so they took all the siding off uh, to reveal what the original structure looked like. Now, when they 
uh, made the house, they would not have left it as logs for very long. They would have put siding over it, if not immediately after it was built, within a year. Because all that, it's mostly mud because they didn't have uh, much access to lime or cement in those days. And on the inside, uh, to make it look better and keep all the, the chinking into the logs, they would take newspapers and other colorful, colorful paper and uh, plaster the walls with that. And so it's just newspaper wallpaper. And then this is what's on that site today. Uh, when you uh, preempted land under the Homestead Act, you had to build that minimum size uh, uh, house, but you also had to clear the land and plant on it. And this is the Isaac Bennett farmstead. Uh, and this is his grandson, Willis Wilson, my great grandfather, uh, plowing the land just as they would have done in the 1850s. Uh, this is a, a letter to uh, uh, the, Min the Minnesota American Missionary Society, and it's a report from Platt Soper uh, for the Congregational Church of Excelsior. Uh, it's dated October 16, 1854, and describes some of the what the village looks like. Uh, it says, the village of Excelsior is on Minnetonka Lake, 30 miles northwest of St. Paul's and 20 west of St. Anthony Falls. We have seven houses erected and a population of 32 souls and are building a sawmill as fast as we can. At present, we have to bring our lumber about eight miles from the outlet of the lake, which means Minnetonka Mills, uh, in our boat, which can carry about 25 feet. We have a very good society here. All our people are from the eastern, the states east of here, and a majority are pious and intelligent. <laughs> the land in the vicinity is all taken up and mostly settled upon by the same class of people. Uh, and now he goes on to explain some of the politics. Uh, and now as to whether he, Charles Galpin, has any enemies I do not know of any at present in this place. A man by the name of Bertram, a member of our church and president of the colony who settled this village, by his conduct had rendered himself liable to the discipline of the church, and considering himself of some importance, he set himself in opposition to Mr. Galpin and indeed of the whole community. He threatened to ruin him if possible and did much to break the peace of our church. I do not think the least blame can be attached to Mr. Galpin, Galpin in the case. Mr. Bertram has gone from here some time and is now uh, unity and peace. I am very affectionately yours, Platt Sober. So uh, Mr. Bertram, who was president of the Excelsior uh, Pioneer Association, he thought he was real important. and. Uh, he tried to rule Excelsior, is what this was saying. And according to the constitution of the Pioneer Association, the selection of lots was supposed to be conducted by drawing names from a hat. But he was so important that he decided that he should get first pick above everybody else. So uh, eventually, they essentially ran him out of town by July of 1854, said that's enough. Uh, a year later, uh, we have a, an article from February 22, 1855. Uh, Peter Gideon, one of the original 1853 settlers, uh, talks about Excelsior. Uh, he said, I will state, here state, for the benefit of community and strangers in particular, that they may not be imposed upon by a set of cheats, that Port Minnetonka and Upper Minnetonka are paper towns and can never be anything else. From their location is certain they were never intended for anything but a swindle, and I feel in duty bound 
to put the honest and, suspect and unsuspecting on their guard. As for Excelsior, I must add, it is truly a temperance town. Yes, we're in a brewery. And any person who deals out intoxicating drinks as a beverage forfeits his lots to the benefit of the public. So if you're caught selling booze, your house, your property, everything is confiscated. Uh, one acre is set apart for a schoolhouse, which will uh, be built as soon as the steam mill gets in operation, which will be in the spring. We have a tavern kept by George Galpin, which is worthy of his calling. So they had a tavern. Well, a tavern in these days was not a bar, it was a hostel, a hotel. So, and place to get something to eat. So that's what George Galpin's uh, uh, tavern was. It was called the Galpin House. It would later be called the Excelsior House. And I mentioned the paper towns. Uh, this is a map of Lake Minnetonka that shows some of the paper towns around here. Up here is Tazaska. Here's Upper Minnetonka, which uh, was also known as Smithtown, which is why you have Smithtown Bay over here. Uh, and over here is Minnetonka City, also known as Port Minnetonka, and later as City of uh, St. Albans on Lake Minnetonka. Now these were called paper towns because that's really all where they uh, existed was only on paper. There weren't very many people living there. Uh, here you can see a plant of Tazaska and there's some 60 different city blocks that are laid out uh, on the upper lake. And Port Minnetonka, uh, no, this is Upper Minnetonka. Uh, so this is Lake Virginia over here and Smithtown Bay over here. Uh, can't really read, but there was a steam sawmill here. There was also a steam sawmill at Tazaska, but really those were the only improvements that were ever built there. There was like one other house and that's it. They were trying to you know, say this is gonna be an important town and they were trying to get people to give them their money for something that really wasn't worth anything. Uh, but everything was speculation in Minnesota at these, this time. People are, uh, just developing this land for the first time and nobody really knows where the big cities are going to land. Uh, here you can see Port Minnetonka, uh, Minnetonka City on the east side of St. Albans Bay and later became uh, the city of St. Albans on Lake Minnetonka. And we jump ahead a couple years to uh, October 1858 and uh, some anonymous person describes uh, the state of Excelsior. I write from Excelsior, an embryo city just struggling into existence on the banks of the noblest of Minnesota lakes, Minnetonka. Started some five years ago by a company of New Yorkers, it has steadily increased in wealth and population and now bids fair to become one of the largest inland cities of the state. We have an excellent water power at the outlet of Galpin Lake, which is soon to be improved by the erection of a flouring mill and tannery. We have an excellent steam sawmill owned by Messrs. Wilcox and Goodrich, which has no superior in the state. The carriage manufacturer factory of Messrs. Stead and Thompson is also doing a good business. We are quiet, industrious, temperate, and Republican people no liquor or tobacco being sold in the town. We have an academy in successful operation under the supervision of Professor F.W. Crosby, formerly of Massachusetts, a talented and popular teacher with a large class of students. The 18 votes cast for the bogus democracy at the late election come from unlettered foreigners living on the outskirts of town. Not that he's prejudiced against them. Um, 
We have three elegant and popular clergymen in our midst, one Congregationalist, one Unionist, and one Methodist. We have as fast horses, handsome ladies, and fat babies as can be found in Minnesota or any other state. There's the women he's talking about. Our scenery is unrivaled, our soil incomparable, and our name, what can be better? Business has revived and several new houses are in the process of erection, which may be mentioned in two large, two-story uh, edifice by Reverend George Galpin on Octagon Hill, which is an ornament to the town. The Young Men's Lyceum has been established and several popular lectures are expected during the coming winter. Uh, and further in 1858, Excelsior got its first newspaper, the Excelsior Enterprise. So it was an up and coming village. This map shows Lake Minnetonka, 1856. It was uh, drawn by uh, Lydia Ferguson and it was attached to this letter to Joseph Holt in New York City. And William Ferguson, her husband, wrote the letter and it's uh, basically telling Mr. Holt, give me some money. Uh, this is a, a transcript of it. And he's asking Mr. Holt for anywhere from uh, one to $5,000. And uh, uh, yeah, that's a lot of money in 1856. And he's uh, asking him to uh, trust him to lend it to the pioneer settlers in Excelsior in around Lake Minnetonka. He used the map to show the environments and you know what the land topography looked like and all the settlers that were out here. Uh, he's saying, I, I'll lend this money out in you know no more than $500 increments at 10 to 12 percent interest rate. And that might sound like a lot, uh, but uh, at the time, rates were three to six percent per month, uh, or forty percent interest rate uh, in the the territory of Minnesota at the time. So uh, Joseph Holt could still make a lot of money lending the money out in Minnesota, uh, but it would also help a lot of people in. Minnesota. Uh, the problem was that uh, they had come and they preempted their land around Excelsior and the South Shore and uh, they got here in 1853 and 1854 but when they filed uh, they filed a little bit later and it wasn't until 1856, 1855 and 56 that payment actually had to be made they weren't accepting paper money. Uh, it had to be in gold coin, and that was all that was being accepted. So uh, money was really scarce at the time. Uh, and uh, he's saying that there are uh, speculators out there that are robbing the settlers you know, because they can't afford to pay. They're coming and saying, okay, well, you give me half of your uh, 160 acres and I'll put up the money for it all but I get 80 of you know 80 acres of land well the day after they file it and pay for it there's an increase in value of five to twenty dollars per acre so these speculators are just robbing the settlers blind uh, William Ferguson is saying that uh, he's refused three dollars three thousand dollars for his own claim over in Deep Haven and considered his timber to be worth ten thousand uh, dollars so th there's you know good security and all that uh, go back to this picture of spirit knob and what do you notice on this there are no trees that's right Bruce <laughs> uh, it was an easy crash cash crop. Uh, the settlers could come in, they could log off their land and be able to pay off any kind of debt and be free and clear. So uh, that's what you're seeing here is somebody cashing in on the land. Uh, 
1857, there was the, uh, a great financial depression that started in the United States. It lasted over two years. Uh, and the settlers were looking for anything and everything in order to make money. Uh, maple sugar was one of them. And there were plenty of maple trees around the shores of Lake Minnetonka, and they would tap that. And they're estimating in this article that they could produce uh, uh, more than 10,000 pounds of maple sugar. Uh, this was a great source of income to the pioneers of Excelsior in Lake Minnetonka. Another uh, thing was ginseng. Uh, the root that uh, would, was growing wild here in China was very valuable. They could make eight cents a pound uh, on the roots here in, uh, in Lake Minnetonka, and a man could get five dollars a day just digging ginseng, which was a huge wage in, in those days. Uh, but after 1858 and 1859, 1860, there were grasshoppers that came and flooded through the, the area. So, uh, and then after that, it was the Civil War. So it was from 1857 on, it was just one thing after another, really testing the pioneers. This is uh, the original land survey of Excelsior Township. And you can see uh, the early roads that are on here. You can see one road up here that swoops down to Stubbs Bay on the north side. And, but there's also a number of them down here around Excelsior. If we take a little bit closer look at that, and you can see what those roads are. And here's Excelsior and the different roads around the lake. See, there's no County Road 19 you know, going up to Minnetonka Beach and Navarre. Uh, these are Indian trails. This is 1853 that this is made. And so there were no roads. This is just what the Indians used to traverse the area. Uh, a little embellishment shows some of these uh, Indian trails still exist today. Uh, this part is part of Highway 7 going out to uh, where, uh, Highway 41. It was known as the Chaska Road because it goes to Chaska. Uh, the Mill Street, another Indian trail uh, in 1850s, it was known as the Shakopee Road. Uh, here's Hogback Ridge, uh, now known as Ridge Road, still in use today, and this, there's a segment of the old Excelsior Boulevard that's missing, but this was all uh, Excelsior Boulevard and Indian trails to begin with. This map is 1860. It's Cook's map of uh, Hennepin County. It's uh, just a, a detail of a much, much larger map, but you can see the infill of the roads and just a few years and they're really starting to make uh, gains in the way of that. Uh, but you can see here's the roads to St. Anthony and to St. Paul. That's how a lot of people got to Lake Minnetonka, but it was a very arduous journey uh, because the roads were not real well and uh, they were traveling through swamps and mires, uh, and it was over 20 miles to Excelsior from St. Anthony and 30 miles from St. Paul. It was much easier to go up the Minnesota River right here and go to Shakopee, and then overland is only seven and a half miles. So, and this is all dry ground. Once you get up the bluff, on the north side of the river, it's really a rather easy journey to get to Excelsior. These two articles uh, uh, describe the travel method to Lake Minnetonka in those days and to Excelsior. The first one is from the St. Paul Pioneer and Democrat, August 2, 1856. 
says for Lake Minnetonka, Mr. Hezekiah Brake has put on a team and spring wagon to carry passengers regularly between this city and Excelsior on Lake Minnetonka. For the present, but one trip a week will be made, leaving Excelsior every Friday morning and St. Paul to return every Saturday morning at eight o'clock, starting from the Merchant's Hotel and going by the way of St. Anthony in Minneapolis. Heretofore, there has been great inconvenience in reaching this desirable point. Visitors and others will now have an opportunity to, of seeing one of the largest and most beautiful of the lakes of Minnesota. Mr. Brake also makes a trip from the lake to St. Anthony and back in the fore part of the week. So you're getting on a wagon with a springboard for a seat. There's no if it rains, you're wet. Uh, and uh, not the most pleasant of trips. Uh, just you know, three years later, uh, Minnesota State News, January 7, 1859, it says, Cheap. Mr. Charles Galpin runs a regular stage starting on Tuesday of each week from Minneapolis to Glencoe and Hutchinson via Excelsior and the fare for the whole distance 60 miles is only 250. All who have business in that direction will consult their own interest by availing themselves of this line. So I mean it's you get one trip a week so that's the great convenience. Uh, if you want to be here on the weekend and go back to, on Wednesday you're just kind of out of luck. You gotta wait the whole week before you can go back. And here is Charles Galpin, the owner of that stagecoach in 1859, one of uh, Excelsior's original 1853 settlers. As a settler, you had to have diverse talents. He was a preacher for the Congregational Church. He was the first minister. Uh, he was a tinsmith. He was a dentist. He, he was uh, the postmaster, and he was also a steamboat owner and captain. And in 1860, he launched this steamboat, the Governor Ramsey, uh, and it was only about 50 feet long, but it revolutionized uh, travel on Lake Minnetonka. Uh, as postmaster, he would take this boat down to Minnetonka Mills, he'd get the newspapers, he'd get the mail, bring it back to Excelsior, and then he would be responsible for reading the newspaper to the citizenry of Excelsior. Uh, this picture is dated August 24th, 1867, and the Governor Ramsey, at this time known as Lady of the Lake, is meeting the very first train to arrive at Lake Minnetonka uh, from the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. And from that point, uh, everything got so much easier getting to Lake Minnetonka. The steamboat could meet people at the train and then take them back to Excelsior, which was the principal town on Lake Minnetonka. When they got to Excelsior, this is what they encountered. And this portion right here is George Galpin's original 1854 Galpin House. Uh, this portion was built in 1866 and then this in 1874. Uh, the image is an engraving from 1876. And uh, this was up you know, behind the Dock Theater where the Dock Theater is today. But you can see there's a little pavilion out on the lake shore where you can get candy, cigars, sandwiches, things like that. You can rent a rowboat or a sailboat. And the steamer May Queen uh, was a charter boat on Lake Minnetonka and would dock right here in front of the Excelsior House. Uh, this is that same location today. Uh, and you'll notice Thomas Tonk, Tommy's Tonka Trolley, where you can get your ice cream and other treats. Uh, the charter boats are still there. Uh, I mean, there's not, except for the hotel that's missing, which 
may or may not ever come to Excelsior again. Uh, very little has changed in the use of this land since 1853. Here's another view of uh, what is now known as the port of Excelsior. And you can see in the, the foreground, there's a sailboat and there's five different rowboats and a very rudimentary dock. This is about 1857, 1858. Uh, Water Street would be coming over just the other side of this fence. And if Lake Street existed at this time, it would have been going right along the lake shore. Here's the Excelsior Commons over here and Gales Island off in the distance. Today, this is the same, the same view. Here's uh, Charles uh, Galpin's uh, Governor Ramsey. Uh, here's the Excelsior Commons in the background. And this boat was kind of unique. Uh, it had uh, wooden machinery in it. So all the gears were wood, so it broke, broke down quite frequently. But it wasn't uh, all that difficult to repair. You just took a nail and pounded the, the wooden cog back into the gear and you were back on its way. But the one, it was kind of problematic in that it had no reverse. So that's why you see it uh, moored broadside to uh, the lake shore. Today, this is that same location. Uh, all this land was filled in 1901, so that boat would have been moored right about here where all the garbage receptacles are today. This is uh, the very first plat of Excelsior. It's 1854, and uh, you'll notice that over here, it doesn't say West Lake Street. There's no street that's even planned in there, but there's no house lots, you know, buildable lots on the lakeshore of Gideon's Bay. The following year, you have a, a new plat, and all of a sudden there's West Lake Street and uh, lots that are on Gideon's Bay. This caused a lot of problems for uh, the, the residents of Excelsior in that if you have an abstract and you look at it, it will just give a description of lot such and such original Excelsior. There were lots of lawsuits about this because nobody could decide which one of these two was the original Excelsior. Uh, but you also see up over here, these are names and they have the lot numbers that were so that each one of these people owned. This is an enlargement of that. Uh, and you'll see that there's only nine people. Well, there were 62 different families that signed up and paid dues to the Excelsior Pioneer Association. In 1853, only 20 of those 60 actually came to Lake Minnetonka. And of those, uh, about half of them went back in the, to East in the fall of 1853 saying, well, I'll be back in the spring. Well, most of them never came back. And you can see the names on here, Charles Galpin, Galpin, Platt Soper, George Galpin, Peter Gideon, Lewis Thompson, Horatio Biedemann, Theodore Pease, Robert McGrath, and Edmund Finney. There's no Bertram on there. Uh, he's gone. Uh, this plant was filed in 1855. He did not get any of his land uh, in Excelsior. So these were the only ones that stayed and these were the founders of the village of Excelsior. Now we take a look at a map. This is uh, 18, uh, about 1858 and it's a little bit blurry. Uh, but you can see here's Mill Street and 2nd Street right here. Uh, there's the wagon factory over here. There's a store here. Uh, there's 
Reverend Sheldon's parsonage over here, uh, the Excelsior House over here. This, at this time, was the main street of Excelsior because so many people were coming in from Shakopee. Taking a little bit of a look at it, and you also, also see Mill Street gets its name from the mill, the sawmill that was built in Excelsior. Uh, this is Galpin Lake right here, and an arm of it is called Crystal Bay. And then it's the outlet of Crystal Bay that kind of follows Water Street down to Lake Minnetonka. Presumably, presumably that's the reason that Water Street got its name is because of the water that was running down it. Uh, but you also notice that this goes right to the corner of Third and Water Street. Uh, this uh, disappeared over the years. Uh, you see lot 12 right here is where uh, James Hervey Clark built his house in 1858. It still stands. It's the guest house, uh, formerly the bird's nest, uh, the B&B, &B, uh, just up at George and Water Street. That used to be Lakeshore property. And that's why it was built there in 1858. Most of this has been filled in. In 1881, the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad came in and it you know, came in right through here. Uh, and so they filled in that part of the lake. Uh, and the last, uh, well, a large portion of this was filled in in 1940. Uh, to make the football field for the Excelsior High School. And then, I think it was 1956, Highway 7 was rerouted and much of the rest of this was filled in at that time. Excelsior, Excelsior Lake is down over here between 2nd and 3rd Street. And this is West Lake and Cortland. So that was all filled in by Reverend Charles Sheldon. Here's a, an article from 1859. Uh, uh, spring has come again, and with its sunshine and clouds, rain and mud, and brings with it a sad calamity for this place. On Sunday morning, the 27th Ultimo, the steam saw and flouring mill of Mr. Wilcox was discovered to be on fire, and despite the exertions of our citizens, it soon became a mass of smoking ruins. A meeting of citizens was held the next day at which it was determined to rebuild without delay. Lost $1,700, no insurance. This is the fourth mill that has been burned down on the banks of Lake Minnetonka, three of them on Sunday morning. So, what do you think somebody's trying to corner the market on sawmills by getting rid of competition? Uh, this was this was a big blow to to Excelsior. Uh, at various times during these pioneer days, there were eight different sawmills on Lake Minnetonka. So I, this was this was big industry in the early days of Lake Minnetonka. Now, if we take a look, uh, just visual images of Pioneer Excelsior. Does anybody recognize this? This is Water Street. This barn right here faces Second Street, which is right here. Third Street would come through right about here. Over here, it's hard to make out, but that's Trinity Chapel on its original location on Third Street. This is 1863-1864. Today it looks like this. <laughs> this map shows uh, 1873 Excelsior, and you can still see uh, how with all the houses along Mill Street uh, and the wagon shop here, uh, and then over on 2nd Street, you have Daniel Connor's house, a shoe shop, carpenter shop, uh, Reverend Sheldon's uh, parsonage, the hotel here, the White House, uh, which was Jenkins' boarding house 
right here. Uh, this was Excelsior's original main street, those two. But with 1867, uh, with the, the railroad reaching YZ and the steamboats bringing people to Excelsior, where did those boats dock? Right at the foot of Water Street, right where they do today, right where they always have since 1853. With all the passengers getting off, it was natural for them to come right up Water Street. Too much of a hill over here on Center Street, and this was all swamp over here. So the only place they could come was Water Street. More uh, pioneer days in Excelsior. This is uh, circa 1880, and it's looking from uh, essentially the upper parking lot of the Excelsior Congregational Church. So Water Street is over here. This is Second Street. The White House is right here. That's where Haskell's is today, except this is on a hill that's about 20 feet, 25 feet tall, which has all been graded down to level. Today, oh wait, you can see in the distance Gales Island over here and Bickford Point or Meadville as it's known today over here across Excelsior Bay. Today, this is the view. Here you can see Haskell's right there, Gales Island, Meadville across over there. Water Street coming right through here. There's the Dock Theater. And this picture was taken from Slater's boarding house, new boarding house. It stood where Carriage Hill Apartments are today. So this is Second Street right here. Right over here, you'll see the Central Boarding House, the Excelsior House over here, Reverend Sheldon's Parsonage, uh, Orpheus Gates, livery stable there. Uh, the White House right here, where Haskell's is today. The Longview House right over here. Here's extension of the commons today. But you also see lots of rowboats out in Excelsior Bay waiting to be rented. This is the same image today. Does anybody recognize this? This is another view of Water Street. This is about 1880, Central Boarding House right here, Leroy Sampson's cash store and the Excelsior Post Office. You'll see brand new uh, boardwalks. Uh, Excelsior got their first boardwalks in 1879. Uh, and if you look at it, there's a hill here. And then there's another hill here. What, Excelsior, Water Street's flat, isn't it, today? Between second and third? Uh, it didn't become flat until it received its current grade in 1885. Uh, and uh, this is Second Street right here and Water Street looking towards Third Street. Uh, and if you're wondering about the sidewalks, Look, we still have trees coming right up through the sidewalks. Uh, we did not get artificial stone sidewalks, uh, now known as concrete, until 1902. And you see the dirt road? They weren't paved until 1916. Today, that same view looks like this. Here's another 1880 image of Excelsior. This is Second Street right here. Uh, Second Street right here with Water Street coming across. Here's George Slater's 1878 boarding house and Reverend Charles Sheldon's uh, parsonage up here uh, close to Center Street. Uh, this was later moved in 1907 to make room for Trinity Chapel. And this building, I don't know why they moved it. Uh, but it now stands over on 3rd Street. Today, that's the view. Here's a letter from Charles Sheldon to the American Home Missionary Society. Uh, we have been disappointed about building our schoolhouse this spring, which we have expected by this time to have as a more commodious place of worship. 
The necessary teamwork could not be obtained in the early spring, and now all the mechanics whose subscriptions in work were our chief dependents in erecting the building are fulfilling other engagements. This work, therefore, must be suspended until fall. Meanwhile, our meetings continue to be held in the room kindly and graciously furnished by Mr. Morris H. Pease over his store. So over his store. Here's that 1863-64 uh, image of Water Street. This is Morris Pease's store. And they're holding uh, church services for the congregational church upstairs. Well, it looks like it's a one and a three quarter story building. They were putting 30 to 40 parishioners in that upstairs. I mean, it was packed. Uh, but in 1857, the church moved into this building. It was uh, Excelsior's first schoolhouse. It was a joint venture of the school district and the congregational church. So school was held in the main floor and upstairs was the Excelsior Academy, which was essentially a, a high school, uh, a prep school but it was also where religious services were held for the Congregational Church. Today, that building still stands. That 1857 building stands at 321 Third Street. In 1870 to 71, the Congregationalists built this church and it lasted uh, for 100 years until 1970 when they tore it down. Uh, here's uh, Charles and Mary Sheldon. Uh, Charles uh, was the pastor from 1855 to 1882. Here you can see the new church taking shape and you'll recognize the building still on the same site as the 1870 church up at School Avenue and Third Street. And uh, the original building faced Third Street. This church faces School Avenue, but considering the, the old church, that's where you get the address of 471 Third Street. For the Episcopalians in the audience, uh, this is where uh, Trinity Episcopal Church was first formed. And this is the the plant of the city of St. Albans on Lake Minnetonka. It was originally uh, planted as Minnetonka City by George, uh, John Hamilton McKenzie. And he built a sawmill here, and you can see two little boxes here. This was McKenzie's Port Minnetonka Hotel. It was a two-story log structure. McKenzie made the mistake of going to Illinois that first winter and getting married and leaving this place in his uh, plant in the hands of Charles Morris. And Morris jumped his claim and took it over, replanted as the city of St. Albans. And to atone for his sins of not being true to his word to Mackenzie, he donated these, this hotel building to Reverend Jacob Sherrill Chamberlain. Uh, for a church. They removed the, the, the floor for the second story and converted into a church. Uh, this article from 1857, uh, the sawmill at St. Albans on the south shore of Lake Minnetonka belonging to C.A.F. Morris and company was destroyed by fire on Monday night of last week. Supposed to be work of an incendiary as it is not known that any fire had been used near the mill for many years. Uh, this was a, one of those paper towns. The few people that lived here started migrating over to Excelsior and the whole village was eventually abandoned. So the church decided 1862 to 63 that they would build this structure. Uh, over on Third Street, just half a block from here. Uh, in 1907, it was moved from that location uh, to make way for the extension of the street railway company, the streetcar system. 
and today it still sit, stands in Excelsior, uh, up at the corner of Center and Second Street. By 1887, you see this map of Excelsior, and the pioneer days are really over by this time. You can see the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad coming into Excelsior, St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis and Manitoba Railroad coming in. So we have two railroads in Excelsior. Uh, there are over a dozen different boarding houses and hotels. You can see all the steamboat docks over here. This was a substantial happening place in Minnesota. Uh, this is uh, uh, Memorial Day, 1892, and you can see the Grand Army of the Republic standing on Water Street. These are all the buildings from 1860s and 1870s. These are the pioneer structures. They all burned on December 31st, 1894. Uh, and that really marked the end of pioneer days at Excelsior. Today, that same image is this location. All right, well, thank you all for coming.